Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You may know by now that uh, we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is entitled, The Role of the Church in the Community. Now, that shouldn't be too hard to figure out, I don't think, but we're going to focus on a special challenge today. The, na the title of this lesson is, Jesus Bad Them, Follow Me. It's the lesson number 11 in our series for September 10 of 2016. You're going to want to stand by because there's some challenging ideas in this lesson. So we, as usual, would like to start with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as we gather here around our table and reach out to the world, may the things that we discuss and the things we talk about be a benefit to all who are a part of this discussion is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may remember that uh, we said back about four weeks ago that they, the, the, the lesson series, we're going we're gonna to follow a sequence. Jesus talks about ministering to people's needs, winning their confidence, sympathizing with them, and now the final thing, that he bade them follow me. So now we're in, that, we're, in that, we're in lesson number four in that, in that sequence, the final lesson of that sequence. And here's some very interesting thing to think about in terms of where we're going with this. In AD 362, and this is in the Bible, your Bible study guide. In AD 362, Roman Emperor Julian launched a campaign to revive paganism. Christianity was taking over the Roman Empire and he and the pagan leaders were worried. Julian's advice to a prominent pagan priest expresses his concern and gives a clue as to why Christianity was growing so rapidly. Here's his words, and I'm going to give you two or three versions of this because uh, nobody, obviously when you're translating from one language to another, it doesn't always come out the same. I think that when the poor happen to be neglected and overlooked by pagan priests, Remember, he talks about priests, but we were emphasizing the fact that these are the pagan priests. The impious Galileans, read Christians, observed this and devoted themselves to benevolence. They support not only their poor, but ours as well. Everyone can see that our people lack aid from us. Quoted in a book put out by HarperCollins in 2006. So here's another version of what he said. Julian wrote of the Christians, these impious Galileans not only feed their own poor, but also but ours also, welcoming them, welcoming them into their agape. What's the agape? Of? A feast. I mean, not necessarily a feast, a meal. It's a meal, okay? Welcoming them into their agape, they attract them as children are attracted with cakes. Hmm. Now, how do, you, how do you feel about I mean, maybe we just need to learn how to make better cakes. Whilst the pagan priests neglect the poor, the hated Galileans devote themselves to works of charity and by, and by a display of false compassion, notice the false compassion, have established and given effect to their pernicious errors. See their love feasts and their tables spread for the indigent. Such practices common among them and cause the contempt for our gods. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? And one more, the fact that Christian charities were open to all, including pagans, put this aspect of Roman citizens' lives out of the control of the imperial authority and under that of the church. Thus, Julian envisioned the institution of a Roman philanthropic system and cared for the behavior and the morality of the pagan priests in the hope that it would mitigate the reliance of pagans on Christian charity, saying these impious uh, Galileans not only feed their own poor, but ours also, welcoming them into their agape. They attract them as children are attracted with cakes. So, is that what we're offering, is cakes? It's a political statement from an, an opposing party <laughs> trying to characterize what we were doing, or they were doing, yeah. in a negative way. Yeah. Remember that Christianity had been an illegal religion for almost 300 years. In 311 AD, Christianity became officially tolerated by order of Gaius, Galerius, Valerius, Maximanus, 
Augustus. You all remember him very well, right? Anyway, there's the, 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 the reference for that on the internet. And then officially recognized by Constantine the Great in the Edict of Milan in 313 AD. Through all of this, Christianity had continued to grow. In fact, it was prospering. The Roman government, which had by that time moved to Constantinople, was concerned about the loss of its influence. Why do you suppose it was that Christianity had developed such an impact on the pagan Roman world? Do Julian's comments help us to understand what had happened? Or is there something else which may be a factor that they didn't mention? And that's the, the, the comment made by, who was it? I think originally it was Tertullian back in the second or third century when he said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. So which is it now? <clears throat> well, if people are attracted to what they perceive as cakes, loaves and fishes, then rice Christians, yeah, yeah, then you know that's not going to make very good Christian. Okay. Using, I mean, if that's what they're attracted to, if 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 his analysis is um, <clears throat> the thing that bears some some integrity to it, then. That, that's that's not going to make a very strong church, I would think. Okay. But uh, what he's commenting on is a very successful church. Mm -hmm. He's just putting a negative spin on it for his own political purposes. Obviously, there was more to it than uh, just goodies because they were staying, they were growing. Uh, those are just the felt needs, you know, whether it's mm -hmm. the cup of water or. You know, and there wasn't whatever. birthday candles on those. Cakes either, it was persecution and and um, yeah. disenfranchisement with their families I mean, and their friends. So it, you, it wasn't wasn't a, when you became a Christian. Certainly in those early days, that was not a um, that was not a uh, easy thing. There's a lot of bad things that, uh, that happened yeah. to you because of that. They, they use the term uh, Galileans a couple times there uh, repeatedly. Is that because they're from Galilee or that they were followers of the Galileans? Followers of the okay. Galileans, okay. Okay. yeah. Okay. Yes. One of the things that, um, that I think is probably a factor with this, it wasn't just that they fed them. Hmm. It sounds to me like they, were, they, um, they befriended them, they had um, emotional, uh, relational, um, contact with these people. Yeah. It wasn't just come eat. It's like now you're my friend, and we'll. And when they talked about the agape, it well, was more than just food. Here's here's the question I would ask: Does it have anything to do with the quality of their religion versus Christianity? You know, do you believe in a bunch of pagan go deities that uh, sit on altars that can't move and are made out of stone, or do you believe in? someone who managed to live a very worthwhile life and die and then raise himself from the dead and go to heaven? I mean... Uh, well, but th we're talking, what date did you mention here, about 321? Three, well, no, the, the, his statement was made in 362. So that's okay. about 50 years after Christianity, the, the, the really, really severe persecution of Christianity had stopped. And, but wasn't this also kind of a a decadent time in Christianity, and not very long after this, when they're yeah, well, willing to accept uh, easily the transition of, of the Sabbath into Sunday. Well, that, and that happened over the next couple hundred years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you talk about the the pagans worshiping their gods of stone, they of course viewed the Christians as worshiping a dead god, mm -hmm. someone who died and nothing and is in the ground. Yeah, but only if, you see, that's only true if it, if, if it didn't rise. Yes. And, and of course, they didn't admit that he rose. <clears throat> well, and we talked about, it, I think it was last week, we talked about the fact that if you stop and think about how preposterous it would be for a handful of followers to make up a story that people would be willing to die for, for hundreds of years in the future, they're still dying for that person. That's a preposterous thing as well. There are people today dying oh. for Muslim, for Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Well, 
Yeah, exactly. Well, there's something to be said for those. But they're Christians right now. Those, yeah. those pagan Roman gods, mm -hmm. you can see them. They may not be able to talk or, or what have you, but, you know, the God that we promote, you can't see him. You, you don't, can't hear him. Or touch him. Right, yeah. So at least you can, an argument by... Our actually, God is seemingly more abstract than the pagan gods. But, but see, that, goes, that fits with, with Plato's idea that the abstract that you can't touch is the real and the material that you can touch is the evil. But through us, uh, God wants to manifest his love. So that b makes God tangible if we're uh, walking and following him. So is that... Loving, loving the community as he, he told us to. So is that what uh, um, the gentleman who's talking about the cakes here is that's what's happening is that although you can't see God himself or itself, we're, they're seeing him through the people. Yeah. That the people are actually manifesting And uh, another, let's, let's take another, and to follow your point, let's take another aspect. How do you think the Christians who were trying to spread the gospel, did they really believe in what they were doing versus the pagan priests? Did they really believe what they were doing? I mean, if you, if you find somebody who's just evangelistic about what they're, what they're teaching, that makes a difference. Then the people who said, well, you know, you know, okay, this one does this one that, with, you know, without much of enthusiasm about it, it makes a difference. So could it be said these Christians at this time were really doing what a Christian should do? That's what Jesus did. He came to to demonstrate the Father. Mm -hmm. And the Father does these things. Mm -hmm. This is the way the Father would be. So therefore, what they were doing was being like Jesus and maybe... More power to them. What, what, an example for what our lives should be like. Yeah. Well, to use some, some illustrations from our, our lesson, Jesus said, this is the parable of the shepherd, Jesus said, I am telling you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man, and I always, I, I shouldn't maybe say this, but I always had a problem with this when I, when I read it, thinking, okay, it's easy to climb in over the wall maybe, but how would you get out with a sheep? Do you have to climb in and then unlock the door from inside? I suppose that's a possibility. Uh, can't imagine how you get a sheep over. Maybe you could throw them over and climb out and catch them later. But I would have thought that if someone was doing that, it'd make, the sheep would make enough noise that, anyway. So this is from John 10. Yes, John 10, verses 1 to 5. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. This is the man who goes in through the gate, is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he has brought them out, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow someone else. Instead, they will run away from such a person because they do not know his voice. And then if you drop down to verse 16 in this chapter, I can do that without getting a little boy. I went way too far. Um, so how do you know the correct voice? Well, I mean, that's, the, that's one of the questions. By experience. You want me to read it? I've got it. Yeah, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> my computer I, has jumped here. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. These also I must lead, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. That's why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well... Back in the, in the early days of Adventism, the way we used to spread the gospel was a group of Adventists would come together. We owned some of the biggest tents in the world at that point in time. And we would take one of these big tents and we would set it up in, in, in a town or something like this. And they would have a camp meeting. And the Adventists would stream in there and 
you know, they, people would see them going, and they'd see this pig tent. Oh, man, well, this is exciting. Remember, there's no radio, there's no television, there's nothing like that. You go out to see what's going on in the town, and people would come out to these things. And so Ellen White comments like this. It has been shown to me that our camp meetings are to increase in interest and success. As we approach nearer the end, I have seen that in these meetings, there will be less preaching and more Bible study. Hmm. There will be little groups all over the ground with their Bibles in their hands and different ones leaning out in a free, conversational study of the Scriptures. Would that be like kind of like what we do here? Well, I should hope so. Okay, we're reading on from a different spot. If one half of the sermonizing were done and double the amount of personal labor given to souls in their homes and in the congregations, a result would be seen that would be surprising. Are we, are, we, are we having too many sermons? One more. It has been less, uh, I'm sorry. It has often been presented to me that there should be less sermonizing by ministers acting merely as local pastors of churches and that greater personal effort should be put forth. Our people should not be made to think that they need to listen to a sermon every Sabbath. Many who listen frequently to sermons, even though the... Uh, uh, even though the truth be preached in clear lines, learn but little. Often it would be more profitable if the Sabbath meetings were of the nature of a Bible class study. Bible truth should be presented in such a simple, interesting manner that all can easily understand and grasp the principles of salvation. Should and that, you stand up and preach that at the church service? We should, because it's part of Loma Linda Messages, page 179. There you go. <laughs> Well, when, when things are broadcast, though, it can be hard to, you have to have a certain format and, yeah. and people exactly. have certain expectations. But, exactly. Uh, yeah, that's true. But, uh, there could, you know, we still have Bible study and uh, small groups and Ellen different White, things. To they, add should, to they should put us on just before the church service. There you go. That way, or right after. Yeah. And... Uh, Ellen White, we would be fitting with what she said here. Yeah. Ellen White said some very interesting things. She said sometimes search services should consist of someone getting in front and clearly and well reading a portion of scripture. Just read it. Sounds like my understanding of what uh, was done in Jesus' time in the mm -hmm. synagogue, yeah. isn't it? A little bit. Yeah. And then, of course, in the synagogue you would, you would read and then you would sit down and comment. So, the question then is, how does that prepare us for those cunningly devised deceptions that Satan will bring to us as this world comes to an end? Is that a good way to prepare? We must become very familiar with the truth and with the voice of Jesus. I mean, isn't that what, we should, what we're supposed to learn from that parable about the shepherd? See, if we know clearly what Jesus teaches, we're not going to be deceived by what the devil proclaims, right? And when we do that, we can be conduits through which God's light can shine out to those around us. And I always brought back to this incredible statement in Steps to Christ, there is nothing more calculated to strengthen the intellect than the study of the scriptures. No other book is so potent to elevate the thoughts, to give vigor to the faculties as the broad and nobling truths of the Bible. How does that work? Is there some magic in the Bible? She goes on, If God's word were studied as it should be, men would have a breadth of mind, a nobility of character, and a stability of purpose rarely seen in these times. Steps to, cross page, steps to Christ, page 90, first paragraph. This should go on to mention there how it should be. Well, that's what I just read. Well, I think that... Um Oh, I'm sorry. You, I said if it. Read, I'm sorry, Dennis. Um, if you God's word were said as it should be. Yes, and I'm, I'm just yeah. wondering if it well, goes on there and, and outlines the five basic points of the should be. Well, the previous quote. Remember, it said free conversational study of the scriptures. So maybe that's what she had in mind. Go well, ahead, Dennis. Closer to, it brings us closer to God, mm -hmm. and He's the one that that enlightens us. 
So uh, it's, it's just part of a, a growing in Christ. We become more like him, and, and uh, that includes facts and different things, but it's much broader than that. Yes, there's, you know, there's some mechanical strengthening as well, some muscle building. Uh, you, you can read a passage and there's some puzzles there. You don't, you don't understand exactly what, there's something that, that doesn't seem to be. And one of the, one of the old, the old fashioned ways was you would take your concordance and you would look up all of those that, 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 that particular word and see how it was how it was used in in different settings so you get the kind of light shining on the word from different ways but and i would remind you that that's how william miller did his thing the way he started the advent movement in north america he sat down he says this is a guy who was a military guy he was doing all kinds of crazy stuff he was a politician and then finally one day he got the idea i'm going to sit down and I'm going to start with Genesis 1-1, one, one, and I'm not going to move to the next verse until I'm sure I understood what that verse says. And he would he sat down with the concordance and with his Bible and started working his way through the Bible. Yes, Dan? This is a lot of what happens on the Tuesday night Bible studies that we have. And the really interesting and rewarding part of that is that we're all studying the same the same verses, the same chapter, the same mm -hmm. text. And then when we share what was personal to each one of us, mm -hmm. there is such diversity in what people get out of that. And to say that I learn from everybody who speaks up is just, just mind-boggling. There are people that I everybody comes up with a different view they have different life experiences they bring to that um, mm -hmm. to that study I just think it's a very powerful useful uh, yeah. way to do it that's one of the reasons why I really enjoy more the the Sabbath school series that are on a book of the Bible and yeah. then you know you know what's coming next you can struggle with it I think I think God has hidden a lot of challenging stories in the Bible a lot of stuff we just sort of just write it. If we stop and say, "Well, why did that happen? How was God involved, etc.?" We there, you got to do some head scratching. Yeah. There, there were some of the um, in some of the Old Testament sections. I mean, Genesis. You know, we would try to look up. You know, other references. We do. Everybody <clears throat> would do their own individual study, but then we would read other commentaries and whatever. It was really interesting. There were some chapters of the Bible that nothing from Ellen White, mm -hmm. just not addressed. You know, uh, um, here in the Loma Linda community, for many years we've had, from time to time, an emphasis on small groups. Mm -hmm. And that was generally the, the approach that the small group went. They, they started, took a, a portion of the Bible or a chapter or, or a book or something like that. Um, but, the, you know, after a while, this brain trust, it kind of begins that you're working with, this little group, it begins to kind of, you've, you've tapped it out. Mm -hmm. So in our community, there's, you can start another group because it's such, uh, so many more people. What about, what about in a, you know, like in a small Adventist church? If you were to run into that, say, but somebody they're listening to us today, maybe two or three, and they say, you know, we're going to do that, and then after a while they run into that problem. Is it is it uh, if it is a problem, mm -hmm. is it is it possible to 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 venture out a little bit and to maybe find some Methodists or some that would be the Baptists best. or I have done Bible study groups with people from all, in fact, even people who are not Christians. And it's very, very interesting to do that. So we don't need to necessarily feel... Don't have to stick with that. Might, might be a good idea to, if, if you are in a small church, to maybe start and build your, build your expertise uh, there among your group, but, but maybe even bring other people in. Don't, don't be afraid to mix with other uh, I groups. had an incredible experience that went on for about two or three years, a number of years ago. Um, a lady 
fr personal friend of mine owned a company. And it was a small company. She had two or three main people who worked for her and some other assistants. But the two or three main people started asking questions. They were not Adventists, no, no, basically no church relationship whatsoever. And they started asking her questions. She said, well, man, I, I don't know the answer to all of it. I have an idea. Let's ask somebody who can help us go through the Bible. And these guys, <laughs> these families were the people, they went from the, the beer and pizza parties on Friday night to a bi Friday night Bible study. And it was absolutely incredible because, I mean, you know, they didn't have these preconceived, preconceived notions about what you, the questions you can't answer and you're not, you're, you can't ask and so forth like this. And, and, you know, they were just, wow, you know, I read that book and, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, why does God do that? And it was very, very interesting. Very interesting. So, getting back to you specifically to how the Bible elevates our thoughts, mm -hmm. I think it's Great Controversy 555, paragraph 2, that says something like, By beholding, we become changed. Mm -hmm. What we allow our minds to dwell on, we become like that. Mm -hmm. So, if you dwell on the Bible, you become more like it. Why do you think Jesus had such a drawing effect on people? Was it just because he healed them? No. He listened. The, 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 well, the incredible thing is, who was it that he drew? I mean, they all knew he was pure as silk or whatever. I mean, it, pure water, whatever. They, there was absolutely no sin in him, whatever. But he, he was just it was like a magnet for sinners. This is uh, an interesting uh, passage from Ministry of Healing 165 called Saved by Hope. We have this, we are saved by hope, Romans 8, 24. The fallen must be led to feel that it is not too late for them to be men uh, or women. Yes. <laughs> using it Thank generically, you. yes. Christ honored man with his confidence and thus placed him on his honor. Even those who had fallen the lowest he treated with respect. Mm -hmm. It was a continual pain for Christ to be brought into contact with enmity, depravity, and impurity, but he never did, but never did he utter one expression to show that his sensibilities were shocked or his refined tastes offended. Whatever the evil habits, the strong prejudices, or the overbearing passions of human beings, he met them with all with pitying tenderness. As we partake of his spirit, we shall regard all men as brethren with similar temptations and trials, often falling and struggling to rise again, battling with discouragement and dis difficulties, craving sympathy and help. Then we shall meet them in such a way as not to discourage or repel them, but to awaken hope in their hearts. Good. And then there's a passage from Micah. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to read you three or four verses scattered through the Bible and, and, and see how these, how these strike you. Re Luke 19.10, The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Uh, it should be obvious. Mark 1, 17, Jesus said to them, Come with me, and I will teach you to catch people. Okay, Luke 9, 2, Then he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And finally, Revelation 14, 6, and 7, Then I saw another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. And, of course, we know it goes on to verse 7. So, is, that, is it clear from those verses that our final task is to get to the last person at the most outer reaches of the world and spread the gospel to them? Is that what we really need to be doing? Which gospel? Well, you weren't supposed to ask that question. <laughs> but that's the real question. Because a lot of stuff that's preached in the name of the gospel, and unfortunately in some cases probably even in the Adventist church, is not really gospel. Well, you have to start where you're at, though. Yeah. There's this saying that the light that sh shines farthest shines brightest at home. So mm -hmm. it's not like, let's go to the ends of the earth and then we can start trying to figure out mm -hmm. what to do. We need yeah. to start where we're at. And then as we progress, uh, it, we just continue on. I think it's saying, you know, don't stop somewhere, just keep going. One of the things that the lesson will talk, our lesson this week talks about is there are church groups who say, let's put on a really good program at church. Maybe people will come. 
how often do strangers just sort of wander into Adventist churches and say, please tell me about the gospel? Not very often. And Ellen White comments about that in Christ's Obvious page 229. She says, we are not to wait for souls to come to us. We must seek them out where they are. When the world has been preached in the pulpit, the work has, been, has but just begun. There are multitudes who will never be reached by the gospel unless it is carried to them. And this, I think, is really the crux of this whole quarter. If we hide away in our little Adventist ghettos, mm -hmm. we are never going to reach the people that are really hungering for, you know, for, for what we have here available and that God has given us a, that charge. If we're not out in the community, if we are not spending time where we'll run across and meet and have contact with people, there's no way that we're going to be able to have the slightest opportunity. It doesn't yeah. happen sitting here. It happens being out there. Well, I'm doing my part because I give my offering and that helps to employ the preacher. And the preacher is supposed to do it, right? That's right. <laughs> uh, we read a quotation a few weeks ago that said we are not to let to think that the pastor is supposed to do all the work. So we, uh, we sort of dismissed that one. Well, I wonder how many of the people here in Loma Linda have ever been to, um, and I can't remember the name of the, 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 there's a society that meets once a month in Pasadena, and they're all very much, you know, the atheists and questioning if there's a God and all of this. And I've been to a Skeptics. number of- Skeptics. Thank you, thank Skeptics. you. I knew there was a good word for that. But I always, just chuckle a little bit on the inside because they're, everybody's sitting around talking about God and that, you know, we, we don't believe this, we don't believe that. And I have a very good friend who is just card-carrying, dues-paying atheist. And I just finally said to him one time, you know, for somebody who doesn't believe in God, you guys spend an awful lot of time talking about him. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, but how many how many of of us even right here in this room have really good friends that right. are atheists, that are Buddhists, that are um, you know, yeah. other completely different Well, I have the privilege of working in a low income clinic and um, there's two things that have really st stick in my mind right now because we just recently had the privilege of ribbon cutting on a brand new, huge new clinic. And obviously we're gonna have thousands of people coming to us. And you'll heal them all. What, oh, uh, wouldn't that be nice? Uh, you know, what kind of witness are we going to have there? And I, when, when, when that happened, I, th I thought, thought back to about 20 years ago when we opened the clinic we're in now, and a wonderful gentleman that from the General Conference came out and he was our he was the chairman of the Loma Linda University Board at that point in time. And he got up and he said, this is absolutely wonderful. Why didn't Loma Linda do this 100 years ago? But in the presentations which we heard at the recent meeting, there's a lot of people who got up from the community and said, I mean, with, people were choked up giving presentations up front saying, this is what our community needs. This is what our community needs. Well, the beginnings of SAC were back in the 60s. Yeah. So that's, you know, I'm glad to say mm -hmm. that it's been around for quite a while. It just has grown and morphed over time. In another place, this would be Ministry of Healing, page 143, Ellen White says, there is need of coming close to the people by personal effort. If less time were given to sermonizing and more time were spent in personal ministry, greater results would be seen. Now, does less time be given to sermonizing, does that mean less time the pastor spending less time preparing sermons? Or does it mean less time of the, the, the congregation listening to sermons? Or both. Or both. <coughs> the poor are to be relieved, the sick cared for, the sorrowing and the bereaved comforted, 
the ignorant instructed, the inexperienced counseled. We are to weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice. Accompanied by the power of persuasion, the power of prayer, the power of the love of God, this work will not, cannot be without fruit. So, what I think I hear you saying here through several things is that active learning is much more effective than passive listening. It's way too easy to sleep through that other stuff. Uh, yeah. So what's the fruit? It says this cannot be without fruit. Okay, Does that, that mean the membership of the church is going to grow? Is, is, are we trying to turn these people into Seventh-day Adventists? or? What's the fruit here? <laughs> okay, well, the, the Bible talks about two different kinds of fruit. And Ellen White talks about the same two kinds of fruit. One type of fruit is what you've talked about, and that's bringing people into the gospel, hopefully, you know, into the kingdom of God. That would be the ultimate goal. But the other kind is the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, and so forth. So, and I... I could be wrong. I don't, I'm, well, I, I'm sure I'm not. Not because of me, but because I've read this from so many other people uh, in so many inspired sources. The challenge for witnessing, which we all need to figure out, get, take our, our, our opportunities to do, is, is important because not, not, it's maybe even more important for us than it is for the people we witness to. Because you don't know how little or how poorly you understand the subject until you try to teach it. What, 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 is, the, what is our good news? Is it the Sabbath? Is you got to keep that? Or is it the 2300 days? Is it um, pre-advent judgment? What, what, what is the... What, well, what are we... What are we I would, uh, most of the time I think we're going out trying to, to turn people into Seventh-day Adventists, <clears throat> which I kind of like those folks, but is, 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 that, is that... The good news is the truth about God and all that that involves. And it's, it, that's, a, that's a big subject, but that's what the good news really is. So if I were to go into one of these small groups that we discussed, mm -hmm. um, my, my goal there would be to what, do what I could do mm -hmm. to enlighten others about the truth about God, mm -hmm. and then, of course, well, grow myself from the experience. And here's the way you do that, the way, I, the, the way that I think is, is suggested by Scripture. Sit down with people and say, okay, let's go. Diane gave an example. Go back. I want you all to read a certain passage of Scripture, a few chapters or whatever. Read this passage. And come next week and tell me, what does this passage say to you about God? That the, the, the scriptures are, are, are about God. So ask yourself, what does this passage say to you about God? And you will have a marvelous experience. Will the ultimate, uh, the, action, the, the absolute ultimate um, consequence be that these people become Seventh-day Adventists <coughs> because they want to they want to do the right thing and be the right thing, and so they're going to see this Sabbath thing and recognize that. Or I, what, I, what, what? I, I don't. I don't think we need to focus on the Sabbath. I well, and, and I don't. Please don't misunderstand me when I say that. I think that if we if we focus on God and the truth about God, the the doctrines will come up as we go through the Bible. They will come up by themselves naturally. We'll say. Well, look at, you know, God says this and this and this. Do we want to be like him? Do we want to follow his advice? Okay. I, I, think, I think part of the, the, um, the beauty of these small groups is I'm not there to, to teach people what I read. I'm there to share what, what um, effect that had to me, how I was convicted by some of these things that, that I would have read but I'm also there to learn from each one of us. Mm -hmm. And when each one of us are sharing, then I'm not sermonizing, I'm not yeah. preaching. I, I am participating in a group 
learning process and we learn from each other almost more than anything else. And we need, I mean, if we're really brave, we need to do that with atheists, <coughs> secular people, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists. We might learn something. So to get started, do I run an advertisement in the newspaper or well, <coughs> put on posters on the telephone poles or anyway, whatever, whatever, whatever it takes. <laughs> what? Invite your friends. Yeah, that that would be the best of all. And that means that we are in the community. We have the friends. We've met the people. We do. We have some other point of contact, and then from there we can move forward. Mm -hmm. With the with the with the emphasis on. You are, you are participating in this, you're even beginning this, not because you're trying to convert people, but because you want to enjoy the experience that comes from studying together. Because, Absolutely. Because I need to continue to learn. Mm -hmm. If I, any time that I'm not involved in one of these groups, I just sort of slide sideways. And as long as I'm staying very focused and, and held accountable from my, from my group, um, partners, it's, it's just very powerful. Mm. And I'm not there, this, this may sound very selfish, but I'm not there for them, I'm there for me. But we're all there to share, mm -hmm. if that I makes sense. Don't know whether I should share this, but I will again. I was one time asked to lead a Bible study group of a bunch of uh, Christians and some non-Christians in, in Africa. There's a group in Africa, and people of different kinds. Of, and so we got going, and we were having a wonderful time. And so one of these people befriended a leader of one of the other seminaries in the area. Another Protestant denomination came, and we were working our way through Genesis, and I was talking about the great controversy and God and the devil and so forth like this. And he listened to this for a little while, and finally he says, why are we talking about this nonsense? You know perfectly well that the devil doesn't exist. Well, that was a right moment. <laughs> I mean, what, how do you respond to that? This is a Christian, head of a seminary. So you, you don't know what you're going to come across. A few years ago, when many years now, when we lived in Washington State, there was a, it was actually a Lutheran prayer breakfast, mm -hmm. men's prayer breakfast that met once a week and a couple of us gotten in, involved with that and it was a friendly exchange of ideas and but it centered around going through passages of scripture and mm -hmm. uh, it was a good good experience so let's suppose you do this for you find a group and you go through for 12 weeks or 12 months or, or whatever um, should you expect that all these people are going to be converted did you expect that all these people are going to become Adventists? You have no your, expectations. What, yeah, one expectations of the, trip us up. Yeah, <coughs> one of the things we are going to focus on in these final few lessons is you have to well, and 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 in the, in the, in the scriptural passage is the story about the weeds and weeds and the tares. You can't you can't you don't have some magic I don't know microscope or 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 a looking glass or something that you can look up and say well. This guy is going to be converted, and that one's going to be converted, and that one's going to be converted. No, you just have to spread your wet, your your net wide, and say, invite in, get in as many as people as you can, and see what happens. And the whole purpose of these is for people to um, establish a meaningful relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And I think that they ought to all be worshiping on Sabbath and mm -hmm. all of that, but they don't. And yeah. that's where God said, where um, I have other sheep. Yeah. And the depth of that relationship will vary from individual to yeah. individual. <coughs> Again, I, I take you to Ministry of Healing, page 470. The badge of Christianity is not an outward sign, not the wearing of a cross or a crown, but it is that which reveals the union of man with God. By the power of His grace, manifested in the transformation of character, Gordon, your passage from Great Controversy 555, um, the world is to be convinced that God has sent His Son as its Redeemer. 
No other influence that can surround the human soul has such power as the influence of an unselfish life. The strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. The strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. Oh, how lovey-dovey do we have to be? <laughs> I don't think we're talking about lovey-dovey here. We have to flow out all the time, and we're always taking care of all these people. Yeah, of course. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, okay, well, let's think about that. Is there enough <clears throat> new, inviting, and interesting material being presented in your church to keep the attention, especially of the younger members? Do people who show up for the first time feel really welcome? Hmm. You really have Honors. to talk to these people. You have to talk to them. <clears throat> I'm one of these people that sits on an airplane and can fly three hours and never say anything to the person next to me and just happy. <laughs> just be and happy. I'm sure they're happy I didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> so You have to play that as you find it. Yeah. I've done flights, I remember one of the last times, from Sydney to Perth, and it so happened I was sat right next to a middle-aged lady, and we managed to talk the whole way through. Mm -hmm. All kinds of things you can talk about. Dennis, I think I kind of interrupted. Oh, me. no, I was, we were, and now I have to regroup my <laughs> thought <laughs> and try, oh, uh, our, our Tuesday night study groups, you know, we have, we have a lot of el older people, but we have some young people as well. Uh, so it's kind of a mixture of, of mm -hmm. everybody. And we have several groups, quite a few groups. Well, okay, I'm going to bring you another quotation. This is from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 371, paragraph 3. The Lord does not now work to bring many souls into the truth because of the church members who have never been converted and those who were once converted but who have backslid. What influence would these unconsecrated members have on new, mem new converts? Would they not make of no effect the God-given message which his people are to bear? That's a scary thought. Is that suggesting that they shouldn't come to the church? Um, I sure read that as a challenge for us to, to seek to become the kind of people that God would, would want us to be. You skipped a little bit right through some of the younger yeah. members, and one of the things that I'm going to speak up about this is I know that it has been very controversial that at the University Church that we have second service com with the sanctuary completely turned over to the young people with their mm -hmm. style of music and their style of worship. Mm -hmm. And I am so proud to be and thrilled to be a part of a church that has such um, an open, welcoming attitude that we can have people on both on all ends of the spectrum, different styles of worship, and have us all be a part of one church and worshiping one God. So I say kudos to the the administration for and Randy Roberts for the um, for taking that risk. Mm -hmm. And the amount of vitality that it has put into the church <coughs> is just very exciting. Well, this is what Ellen White seems to suggest as a possibility. Jim, are you going to comment? I was going to, uh, uh, Matthew 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you traverse sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice a ch as much a child of hell as yourselves. What version is that? <laughs> well, that's the RSV. But third, uh, excuse me, seven times in chapter 23, starting at verse 13, Jesus condemns the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes were the teachers the, uh, and the preachers and so on and so forth. So if we don't have a clear message, mm -hmm. if we're just doing it, if it's a numbers game to get more, whether it's Adventists or more Christians or more believers, what are they believing? Mm -hmm. The truth about God or some yeah. thing that's that's enslaving and, and well, uh, here's a possibility where we're running down on time Ellen White Christ top lessons page 69 Christ is waiting now we want to know what he's looking for with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church 
when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. It is the privilege, it is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 3.12 margin. Were all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. Quickly the last great harvest would be ripened and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. <clears throat> so there, that's another way to put it. In Jesus' experience when he was here, he had, we talked earlier about the fact that he seemed to attract sinners. There's a very interesting story about a little short man by the name of Zacchaeus. And the kids love to sing about Zacchaeus, you know, Zacchaeus, come down, and famous song. But Zacchaeus desperately wanted to see Jesus. He had he'd listened to John the Baptist, who preached not very far from Jericho, and then he got interested in Jesus, and he'd heard about him, and, he, 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 and so he'd already started to try to amend some of his ways, but it wasn't easy. Ellen White says, Desire of Ages, page 552. But the way back had proven difficult. Now that Jesus was actually in his home city of Jericho, Zacchaeus was determined to see him. Try to imagine this wealthy tax collector running through the streets, trying to get ahead of the crowd, and then climbing up in a tree while wearing all his expensive robes. Were the children laughing at him? Try to imagine his incredible surprise when Jesus stopped right under him and said, come down Zacchaeus, I want to stay at your house tonight. That statement a moment ago about when the... Characters. Yeah, when, when, when everything is all nice and pretty in the church, then the Lord can come. Uh, how complete does that have to be? How long does it take a person to get to that, to that level? And if we keep bringing all of these sinners in all the time. They, they can't be to that level to begin with. How long is it going to take them to get to that nice little well, level of perfection? Or I, perfection's a wrong I, I word, but... I, I, won't, I won't profess to give a complete answer to that question, but what I can tell you is this. Ellen White says, as we approach the end of time, the, the process, the changes that will take place in people will be faster and faster. What and it's not point? our job. Well, go ahead. What about the thief on the cross? How yeah. long did that take? Yeah. <coughs> well, Part and of she, an afternoon. And, and she says very clearly, it's not our job to do that. It's the Holy Spirit that does that. We just give him the opportunity, and he does the work. So now we're blaming this delay on the Holy Spirit? No, no, no. We're blaming the, this delay on our not giving him an opportunity to do the work. <coughs> Evangelist Mark Finley reminds us that not to introduce God to people is spiritual malpractice. Jesus' method of evangelism was to touch people at their points of greatest need. That is medical missionary work. But Jesus did not stop with meeting their physical needs. He welcomed them into the kingdom of God and he offered them eternal life. Do you feel uncomfortable inviting people to come to church or even to accept Christianity? Do you think that job should be left for the pastor? Are you <laughs> Am I going to have to learn to talk to these people on the airplane? <laughs> yeah. Can I just give them a pamphlet? Well, that's a, that's a start. As you become acquainted with new friends, and hopefully you have some, hopefully you have some, and you ask about their family and their occupation, do you feel comfortable asking about their religion, their church? Might that give you an opportunity to share your personal testimony? Personal testimonies are very powerful ways to witness. As you know, Paul had an opportunity in Acts 26 of telling his story to King Agrippa. We have a very abbreviated version of that, I'm sure. But think about what Paul did. He says, I used to be a persecutor of the church. Then what happened on the Damascus Road, he told about that. And then he said, look what's happened to me from that day until now. And now... I wouldn't go back for anything. Is that a complicated sequence? I mean, we haven't all had Damascus Road experiences, but that sequence, that's the way people become Christian. <coughs> well, have you ever had anyone come to you and say that she or he would like to know more about your church? 
more about Christianity? How did you feel? People don't tend to do that, just yeah. walk up and say, well, I want to hear more. Usually that's a part of a whole um, conversation, sometimes even on airplanes. Do we... You know, you know, if it depends your situation. If yeah. I told him I was, if I was Methodist or Baptist or something like that, they might ask that. But when you tell them you're a Seventh Day Adventist, they kind of uh, clam up and sneak off into a, someplace <laughs> trying to get away from you because you're kind well, of weird. That, that isn't the gospel, though. That Telling him you're a Seventh Day Adventist is not the gospel. Thing. The good, it's thought, not good news that you're a Seventh-day Adventist. What no. comes to mind? They'll, they'll think, probably think you're a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness because they don't know what a Seventh-day Adventist well, is. You can't ask the question, what, what, you know, what if somebody asked you? I, I was on night shift in the state hospital in Sydney, <coughs> working with a female nurse. There was two of us on the night shift, and it was a quiet night. Cops weren't bringing drunks in. It was one of those rare times. And this uh, lassie said, why don't you smoke? That started a whole thing. We spent a large portion of that night, we did our rounds and all that stuff, and what medicines at night shift some people got and whatever. But by the time the night was over, we discussed the Sabbath, all kinds of stuff. She'd mm -hmm. never heard it before. Right. Now, did she convert there? No, I never saw her after that. And to, I, I found out later that she'd gone to England with her husband or a boyfriend or something. Who knows what that might have led to? That's right. And she, she, she'd noticed. I don't. You don't swear. You don't drink. You don't yeah. smoke. What's going on here? Yeah. We're running out of time, but I'd like to ask you out there a question. <coughs> what would it be like to work with the Holy Spirit? You thought about that? You know that the Holy Spirit's trying to reach out to people. So if you're reaching out to people, what are you doing? You're working with the Holy Spirit. So, and there are lots of ways it can be done. We don't have all the answers. You've heard some ideas here, some suggestions, and maybe some ideas about we, we shouldn't try. Uh, but remember that conversion is always the work of God. I mean, 100% the work of the Holy Spirit. So, we'll leave it up to you. The ball's in your court. What would you like to do? What would your charge like to do? Our kind and loving Heavenly Father, we think about you. We pray to you. We worship you. And now we ask that you will guide us to give us opportunities. Maybe make us more sensitive to those around us so we can find opportunities to witness on your behalf is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.